Good evening. I'd like to call to order this regularly scheduled meeting for the City Council of the City of Calistoga. It is Tuesday, November 20th, 2018 at 6.01 p.m. City Clerk Flamson, has this meeting been properly noticed? Yes, it has. Thank you very much. Can we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Lopez Ortega? Here. Councilmember Barnes? Here. Councilmember Krause? Here. Vice Mayor Dunsford? Here. Mayor Canning? Here. Um, if you'll all please stand and join me for the salute to the flag. Uh, upon conclusion of the Pledge of Allegiance, we will remain standing for a moment of silence for those victims of the two wildfires uh, in Northern California and Southern California. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Obviously, obviously the situation is tragic, tragic in both <coughs> parts of the state of California, more so uh, in Butte County, and brings back the harsh reality of what this community faced just a year ago. Um, if not for a lot of hard work and Mother Nature and no change in winds, uh, this community very seriously could have ended up in the same situation where paradise is. So please do what you can uh, when you can and think of those folks. Uh, I just couldn't imagine losing 80% of your community in a matter of a day. Um, so please keep that in mind and obviously stay vi vigilant. This is uh, going to be a reoccurring activity and situation that we're going to face year after year um, at this point. Um, we had a closed session last Tuesday, did I get that right? Um, which we will report out in a moment. Uh, it's an agendized item regarding the Napa County Fairgrounds. So you will get that full report uh, as one of the agenda items toward the end of the meeting. Um, with that said, we will move on to oral communication on consent items or non-agendized items. The I this time is set aside to receive comments from the public regarding matters on the consent calendar or matters of municipal concern that are not on the agenda. Pursuant to Government Code Section 54954.3, also known as the Brown Act. However, the Council cannot consider any issues or take action on any request during this comment period. Speakers are encouraged to limit their comments to a maximum of three minutes so that all speakers have an opportunity to address the City Council. I do not have any speaker cards, but is there anyone in the uh, public who is interested in addressing the Council on a consent item or a non agendized item? All right, with that, I will close oral communication and I'll entertain a motion to adopt the meeting agenda as presented unless a modification is requested. So moved. Second. I have a motion by Councilmember Krause, a second by Vice Mayor Dunsford. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Council requests and ideas for discussion. Councilmember Lopez Ortega. As, I, as um, you mentioned, uh, Mayor Canning, I want to express my support for the victims of uh, their recent fires and to their families. We have some locals in our community that they are going through, uh, to, you know, through the trouble, trouble that the disaster caused. Um, as, and also as a close and a strong community, we need to be aware that anything that can cause harm and suffering to our neighbors. We need to take care of each other in case of any emergency or natural disaster. And also I want to thank you to, to say thank you to our police department for the initiative of collecting cars and coats to bring to the victims. And, um, and I just want to say happy Thanksgiving to all of you from my family and me, myself. Thank you very much. Council Member Barnes. I ask two things. Uh, I, too, join Mayor Canning and the rest of the council uh, in those feelings for the poor folks up north. Uh, it hit home a little harder for me. Uh, we were evacuated, of course, a year ago, and my sister lives in Thousand Oaks. Uh, Westlake Village was evacuated 
uh, she was out of her house for four days. Uh, they s escaped unscathed, no damage to the family or the property, but it just brings it home a little more. Uh, and secondly, um, I'd like to thank all of you that came out to the American Legion uh, Veterans Day program. I know it was very smoky out there and the attendance was down, but for those of you that showed up, thank you. We really appreciated it. And we sat outside in the smoke for 30 hours in front of Calmart and we collected $1,901 for the American Legion. Thank you for your generosity. It all stays here in the community, helping veterans or widows or widowers of veterans, kids, sponsor us off our baseball little league team and do other things with our limited budget. So thank you again to the community. Thank you. Councilmember Kraus. Yes, to kind of dovetail in with some of the comments about the uh, wildfire situation, uh, we have had a couple of meetings here in the community uh, to kind of debrief uh, about the uh, wildland fires. Uh, and uh, recently we had uh, Bill Dodd here to discuss some steps that have been taken in the state legislature. And then um, uh, we also had a meeting with PG&E to talk about the power shutoff. And one of the things I think this council should do, or the next council, is uh, to hold a, one of the mayor's forums uh, specifically on issues to the city of Calistoga, amongst which I would include uh, evacuation plants. One of the big problems in Paradise, as I have heard it, is that there were four exit routes. They all became very quickly congested and people died in their cars and on the side of the road. And there are ways to mitigate that. Um, and that is to have places of refuge within the community. And uh, one of those places of refuge certainly could be out in the middle of the golf course uh, uh, because the combustibility of the vegetation around there is very low. And uh, you get a lot of people in there and you could protect them very easily. So uh, I think there's going to be some lessons on survival that come out of the paradise situation. And I think we should take those lessons and see how we can apply them here in Calistoga as well as uh, owning our evacuation plan because sooner or later it's going to occur again around us. We live in a very combustible environment. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor Dunsford. Uh, nothing to add, but certainly share the sentiments that have been expressed regarding the fire victims. Thank you. Um, I want to thank the community for your generosity. We had uh, yet another very successful uh, Calistoga Firefighters Association bingo. Um, unfortunately, I was unable to be here. I was on the East Coast, but uh, I heard they I did I was a well. winner. You were a winner? Nice. You probably <laughs> won because I wasn't there. That was my card. <laughs> Um, I want to say thank you to Calistoga's American Legion. Uh, I attended the Veterans Day program, and as they always do, a first-rate program. Thank you very much for uh, honoring those that have served. Uh, and a happy Thanksgiving to all of you and your family and neighbors and friends. Um, enjoy yourselves and uh, be thankful for what you know we should be um, on a daily basis. So thank you very much for that. Um, City Manager's Report. City Manager Feek. Um, just two brief items, Mr. Mayor. First, uh, just make sure everyone's aware, next week we have a very big uh, special event coming up, as you all know, the Holiday Village Lighter, Lighted Tractor Parade. So, Mayor Canning, this is probably uh, 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 has less involvement with the parade this year as in years past, but we're really excited. We've made There have been some significant changes uh, just to how we plan for the event. I think it will be a better event, a safer event. Um, but also a very enjoyable event for uh, families, for Calistogans, and all the guests who come to town. This will um, actually be the mm -hmm. first tractor parade in eight years where I'm a spectator, not an organizer. Excellent. Well, I'm sure people Looking are going to be pulling to you it. in each direction, <laughs> though. Um, the other item, uh, which I've asked uh, our Deputy Public Works Director, Derek Rainer, to come and just share with City Council related to our uh, uh, pavement condition assessment. Derek, if you would. Derek, welcome back. Please introduce yourself. 
Thanks, Dylan. Uh, my name is Derek uh, Rayner. I'm Deputy Director in Public Works here for the City of Calistoga. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the Council. Uh, here tonight to just give you a quick update on our pavement um, condition index, which is done every two years, basically. Our, our streets get inspected and they get rated from zero to 100, uh, 100 being the highest rating. And um, our last inspection was in 2016, and we were at a 52, so we're kind of right in the middle there. And we were projected to go down to about a 49, which is uh, going from the good condition to the poor condition overall for our streets in the city. Um, we have good news to report. Um, the evaluation or inspection that happened here in 2018 shows that we went up 15 points. So we're at a 64 um, now instead of um, a projected 49. And that's thanks to um, the budget that's been authorized um, the last couple of years by yourselves um, to authorize improvements to the roads. We've, uh, we've done two phases of road improvements on Lake Street. Um, we've also done a lot of microsurfacing. We've done about a million dollars worth of microsurfacing projects around the city. And we are currently working on Spring Street right now with a utility and road improvement project. Our up and coming projects are going to be Washington Street from Barrie down to North Oak. And we will also be working on Cedar from Lincoln to Spring Street. So um, where we kind of sit as far as comparison to other Bay Area cities, uh, the average Bay Area uh, rating on roads is about 67. So we're just slightly below that. Um, the top tier cities, um, for example, Palo Alto had a rating of about 83. Um, part of the report that comes out um, gives you a projection on, you know, based on the amount of money that you put towards roads in the future, what your projected um, PCI condition would be. And um, one of the projections is if, if we spend about a million and a half dollars, which the last two years we've done about two and a half million, um, that our projection in five years would be up at like an 87. So it'd be, um, we also have some other funding um, that's made available through SB1, about 100,000 a year, and then Measure T, about 300,000. Um, so if we just used that money, alone we're projected in five years to go up about five points from 64 so um, anyways good news and thank you uh, very much uh, Derek uh, just briefly could you speak a little bit about how you make the decisions on which roads and pavements to fix first uh, yes that's a very good question <laughs> <laughs> um, yes yeah, so we we basically got all the low-hanging fruit with um, these road projects that have happened over the last couple of years. To go up 15 points is significant. And it's all been surface treatments mainly. So we've done the microsurfacing, the chip seals, the slurry seals. Um, and those are, you know, you get a lot of bang for your buck on those types of projects. And the up-and-coming projects are going to be more intrusive. Um, they're going to be more major rehabilitation of roads, um, actual removal of pavement and utilities. If they are in an age and condition that's very poor, we're going to re replace uh, utilities at the same time. So projecting in the future, you know, we got about seven and a half points, the, you know, over the last two years to get 15. But in the future, you're only, you know, we're only going to go up about four to five points if we if we do about a million and a half dollars a year. So it's going to go up a little slower in the future, just just for reference. So it's my understanding that we fix the more easily fixable roads first. We did because you get more bang for the buck, and the ones of which we have several streets in town that are in very bad shape, but unfortunately they're they're the old concrete ones, the old really expensive ones yes we save what we can first and concentrate on those really tough ones later correct even though it seems counterintuitive yes okay thank you thank you any other questions no just uh, a comment you thanked us for setting aside 
significant amounts of budgeting for road works in the last couple of years, but uh, the real thanks has to go to uh, this community who voted and approved the, on the two referendums for the two resort projects because the reality of the situation is we would not have had these funds available to us if we did not approve those resort projects. And we know uh, how important, because it's the biggest complaint we get on a regular basis, roads and sidewalks are to people. So this is a clear demonstration uh, of that, uh, uh, the community's initiative to go forward with that, that's paying off. And this is even before uh, any Measure T or SB1 gas tax funds were made available to us. So uh, we are seeing the results of uh, of this community taking that on. So thank you all for that. Thank you. City Manager Feek. Um, if I could, just one other addition I'd add to the roads report, and thank you very much, Derek. Um, another project which wasn't mentioned was uh, Grant Street. So we're working on improvements to Grant Street. Um, I think it's important, and you have an item on your consent calendar here, uh, you know, John Draper, who's been, you know, former public works director, who's been very helpful with us in planning for future projects. One of the things we're doing is we're planning our roads projects, our utilities projects uh, in advance. So working on projects this year in anticipation of construction the following year. And we always want to have projects ready to go. Another key element uh, uh, that Derek had spoke of is, you know, we have underground utilities which need to be replaced. And we have significant underground utilities all throughout town. So we also focus on what are the most uh, heavily used streets in town. That's why Derek made reference to uh, Cedar Street to Washington Street we also have Grant Street so several sections of road where utility work is needed but also are more important in our community circulation focus there so you know we probably won't see a Harley Street a fourth street for some time because we want to address the, the roads that are more heavily used first which also have the underground infrastructure too thank you Thank you very much. Moving on to proclamations, presentations, and awards. And the first thing we have is a presentation to the City of Calistoga Department by the Grateful Hearts Project by Karen Ingalls. Karen, welcome back. Please come up to the podium and introduce yourself and tell us about your program. So, um, Everything that we're going, th we're watching our neighbors to the north and to the south go through certainly brings back what we went through last year. And um, this project was a way of saying thank you to people who did so much to um, defend us and protect us. And um, we can't do what you did, but we can make art to say thank you. And that was what this is all about. I, I also wanted to thank the Arts Center because it provided a space where we could bring people together. And there were 32 people who were involved in this in one way or another. And, um, and also to the Arts Council, which provided a grant which paid for much of what we did. Not everything, but most of it. And um, so we have paintings that we'd like to present. And um, shall we start with the one to the city? Do you want us to go around? How shall we do sure, this? Sure, you can come around Kathy's okay. side. All right. <laughs> so the one for the city of Calistoga. Um, Kathy, can you use the mic? There we are. <laughs> this was created by Penny. Thank you. This was created by Penny Warsham. And did you want to say anything about it? Well, it, it was a collaborative effort with Karen and I. But the idea was of all the people represent, the faces represent the people that are grateful, meaning all of us. And of course, the heart, because it is the heart project. We love that the firemen and the policemen are here to protect us. And um, there's words here of um, boldness and saving, heroism, fearlessness. Up here are words of gratitude, of praises, appreciative, 
honor and grateful. So that's what it represents. And this was, did come from my heart, and, it, and I worked on it <laughs> very hard <laughs> to make it exactly the way I wanted it to. And I also added the state of California since this, these fires are affecting all of us, my family included, who are up in the Paradise area, but they're okay. Yeah, we don't know about their homes, but they're okay, so I'm glad. So that's, I'd like to present this to the city. Thank you very much. Okay. So this is from Julie Kaplan. No, no, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. This is from you. Yes. Okay. So this one is for. Um, this one is for Chris, our mayor, and um, and I understand that you did a lot of advocacy to make sure that they did not forget Calistoga when you were working with all of the um, people from all over. And I know it's easy to forget us because we're little and we're up here, but um, thank you for everything. Thank you. So. Oh. <laughs> so. Um, this also is from a, um, an image of one of the, the trees from the hearts that you also helped me <laughs> with. <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> okay. All right. And this one is for you, Irais. I understand that you did a lot of translation to make sure that everybody in our community knew what they needed to know. So, thank you. You're very welcome. This one is from me, this is my creation, um, to um, Vice Mayor Dunsford, for all you did. <laughs> so, this is a watercolor that I did of the um, Sharpstein Museum and a collage that I put together with. <laughs> Kathy told me how you fed everybody and that you cooked to make sure everybody had I something to eat. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he got to feed the mayor every night too. He's a pretty good cook. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, Chief Mitch. <laughs> This is for the police department. Thank you very much for making sure we were protected, that we got out okay, and, um, and that we didn't have to come home to find our homes looted or anything, anything like that. So thank you very much. <laughs> oh, okay. Diane? Diane Kirkendall did the one for the fire department. So. Do you want to explain? <laughs> well, it was my honor to do something for the fire department. My husband is a retired firefighter from the city of Napa. And so in our family, we know that firefighters are heroes every day, and that's my sentiment here. And I was so pleased to get to take a photo of your wonderful firefighter, Adam Ramirez, in that. So thank you very much thank for you. everything that you do. Heroes every day. <laughs> and we probably should have given this to you first. <laughs> thank you so much. And there's one more for the Department of Public Works, because we understand that you made sure that there was water to help put out <laughs> fires, and that's pretty important, <laughs> to say the least. So in this one it says, thank you to our unsung heroes who make sure that everything works. 
You're welcome. Thank you guys very, very much. We You're really welcome. appreciate it. Thank you. And, uh, thank you thank very you. much for all you guys did. And yeah. Julie's painting isn't one of these, but she worked very hard <laughs> yeah. on everything. My recipient is not here. She did one for Calmar. <laughs> thank you for that. Thank you. So we'll, uh, when we conclude the meeting, we'll leave these up here. If anyone wants to come take a clo closer look, they are beautiful. And thank you guys for your time and your effort and for uh, sharing your, your, your talents and your art and give back. Thank you. Um, next, we have uh, a presentation by Planning and Building Director Lynn Goldberg. Lynn, welcome back. Thank you, Mayor, Council. I'm just going to take a few minutes to update you and the community on some things that the Planning and Building Department have been working on this year. <coughs> uh, we do have multiple projects in review right now. We've been uh, working on bringing this particular project, the Lincoln Avenue Apartments, to the Planning Commission, hopefully in the near future. Uh, I would uh, add 78 apartments to the community on the uh, upper end of Lincoln Avenue. Uh, we've also been working on the Veranda Hotel, which would be a redevelopment of a portion of the Gliderport uh, property with a hotel, apartments, and uh, replace the laundromat, among other improvements. Uh, we've also been working uh, with the developer, potential developers of the Yellow Rose Ranch. Um, starting the environmental review process on that and uh, also working through the design um, with the other departments on the street standards and items like that. They've also been having uh, multiple outreach meetings to the community. Uh, we've also recently received uh, an application for the Grant Street subdivision um, that would add 13 lots between Maggie and Michael. We're just beginning to look at this application. We only received it a few weeks ago. Uh, obviously, there will be substantial environmental review on this particular project. So other projects in the review are uh, Roman Spa Expansion, which we've been working on for a number of years, uh, modifications to the Calistoga Hills project, which is before the Planning Commission next week. Um, these are modifications to potentially relocate some of the back of house uh, facilities and activities to uh, another portion of the site that um, has been added since they um, originally proposed the project. Uh, the Lincoln Avenue Brewery in the former location of the uh, Puerto Vallarta Market on Lincoln Avenue. Uh, right now they're focusing on just getting the restaurant reopened and not too much on the brewery part of it. Uh, Aurora Park is uh, requesting the expansion of their um, visitor accommodations by adding three cottages. And uh, also Myriad Cellars is proposed at the Six Foothill, which is at the very end of uh, Foothill, closest to St. Helena. That one is, uh, has been stalled for a few months. Uh, we also work, of course, on advanced planning projects. Uh, we brought you the Wayfinding Sign Program, and uh, some of these signs have been installed. The, uh, the six signs have been installed at the public parking lots and uh, also directing visitors to the restrooms. Uh, the next phase are um, three much, much larger uh, directional signs, which are intended to um, provide quick directions to um, visitors' community entering from uh, Foothill and also from Silverado Trail. So these will be placed along Inc Lincoln Avenue and direct people to things that they're going to want to quickly find, which is parking restrooms, information at the information center, visitors information center, community center, and the fairgrounds. Uh, we actually have received these uh, lovely signs, and they're sitting out at the courtyard. And uh, if you approve an item that's on the consent calendar tonight to switch some funding around, we can get them installed, hopefully, in the near future. They've got a great view of the Palisades right now but they'd be much better on Lincoln Avenue. <laughs> uh, something else we're working on is um, the design for the Silverado Trail Gateway, which would provide um, parking, restrooms, picnic areas, um, information on the Oat Hill Mine Trail and the Napa Valley Vine Trail. Uh, this is a city-owned property at uh, the corner of Silverado uh, Trail and uh, the northern end of Lincoln Avenue. 
Um, we're, we've got um, a final proposed design for that that we just gave comments to uh, the landscape architect who's a consultant on the project and hope to be uh, bringing it to you uh, next year early next year. We've also been working on some ordinances and policies, the potential cannabis dispensary regulations, um, updating various general plan elements, trying to do those in-house, uh, including the infrastructure element, which is uh, out of date, uh, addresses uh, water, wastewater, storm drains, uh, the geothermal element. We had a, we we're taking a different approach to geothermal resources um, in the last few years. Um, then we took 15 years ago and uh, also economic development which the circumstances behind that element have vastly changed in the last 15 years as well and it's time to update that element. Some of the other things we're working on is um, giving, uh, applying for grants and um, helping to issue uh, rehab loans. So we've issued 40 to date uh, using home and CDBG funding. We still have some money available and we're working on loaning that out. Um, we've had a couple repaid and so that will cycle right back through and so we'll have a continuous flow of uh, loans under that, those programs. Uh, in the building section of our department, we've been um, really happy to see the uh, Calistoga Senior Apartments project open. Uh, planning was very involved at the beginning, uh, you know, helping to secure the property and doing the environmental and getting it through the planning commission and all the various uh, permitting. Uh, Public Works was very involved in the outfall, new outfall to the Napa River and um, addressing a lot of challenging storm drain issues on this site but we're very happy to um, see it open as we are with the uh, Francis house which was a long time in the making we um, brought it to planning commission with a design review and use permit variances and uh, our building official Brad was out there uh, spent a lot of time out there um, as this beautiful building was reconstructed uh, also continuing to monitor the construction at the Silver Rose project on the Silverado Trail. The top part, um, the top photo is a shot of the uh, main entrance to the uh, where the check-in will be, the underground parking. These were taken at the end of October. Unfortunately, we couldn't get a more recent picture because of the smoke situation. And then the uh, photo in the lower corner is uh, the entrance uh, you can see the homes in the foreground uh, along Silverado Trail, and this would be the view coming into the city, up, uh, going up valley on Silverado Trail. So as you can see, this is moving along, and um, hopefully we'll be ready for occupancy next year. And other things we've been working on in the building section, uh, we're doing plan checks on an expansion to Solage, which is going to be adding 11 cottages and a meeting room, a uh, new single-family dwelling at, on Emerald Drive, uh, two duplexes on fairway and a seismic retrofit of 1345 Lincoln which we hope to be um, issuing the building permit for that soon we're very interested in getting that building retrofitted since it's all masonry and uh, the building section is also working on getting uh, certain building permits uh, available online so that people can apply for things like re-roofs and furnace replacements without having to set foot in our um, department and um, asking for inspections online. So I've um, been working on that for quite some time. It's a little problematic getting the uh, payment system to work and get coordinated. But um, that will help our workload and make it easier for other people, uh, you know, our, our customers um, to pull building permits. Uh, we're also working this year on the ins inspection of the Fairway Mobile Home Park. We um, have gotten all of the lots plotted um, in that park for the first time so we actually know where the property lines are for each of those uh, lots which we've never had in the history of the park so uh, we're working our way slowly trying to um, get as much as we can into conformance with state law oh that concludes my presentation happy to answer any questions so Lynn, other than that, what have you guys been doing this year? <laughs> uh, yeah, we have definitely seen an uptick in activity. Pretty amazing work uh, considering and the resources you have. And I, we've added just recently our new senior planner. I'd like to introduce to those of you who haven't met him, Zach Tessinger.
Zach, welcome aboard. Uh -huh. Hey, Zach. Thanks for coming. He uh, definitely hit the ground running and has not been bored in the last seven <laughs> weeks, I don't think. No. Both, both feet <laughs> to the fire right away, huh? Yeah. Um, so thank you very much. A uh, couple comments just uh, as clarification. When we talk about projects that have been applied for, projects that have been proposed, products that, uh, projects that have been are under review, for clarification, that does not mean that these projects have been approved. They have not gone through the hearing process because you read about it in the paper. It doesn't mean that it, it actually exists. Yes, those first few examples were ones that were working The Veranda, on right now. Lincoln Avenue Apartments, Grants the Yellow Rose, Rose Ranch, Ranch. Right. Uh, Grant Street, etc. So there's still the opportunity for public input and comment on that. Um, so keep yourselves informed when those come forward and when there is work being done because this is something that a question that was raised to me when there is work being done by staff on these projects prior to the going to hearing the project applicants actually pay for the work that the city staff does so they have to pay for all of our resources all of our work and they still may not be approved uh, but it is not an impact to the city's budget because they are required to pay for those those hours and those uh, uh, resources. Absolutely. And in terms of your downtown signage program, it looks fantastic. It's a complement to the mapping program that went in two years ago now. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, and the only thing, the only feedback I've gotten on the signs other than they look great is when can we have signs that tell people not to ride their bikes on the sidewalk? And I know you and I have uh, spoken about that, so we're looking for uh, some solutions. Any other council members? Uh, yeah, Lynn, a very good report. Thank you. And you have been working incredibly hard. Uh, there's one that I noticed that is not on here, the apartment condo complex across from the Monhoff. I thought that was somewhere within the process. That has been approved, and uh, we're told by the developer that they're going to submit for building permits in oh. January. Oh, That's so the latest I, word. Okay, I thought it had been approved. I just didn't see any Yeah, action. it was approved a year ago, actually. Yeah. Um, we had to do a time extension on it. We were hoping they were going to come problem, in perhaps. in May. <laughs> I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but uh, I did just recently check with them, and the latest we've heard is that they will be submitting in uh, January. We hope that goes quickly. They've built similar projects elsewhere so uh, hopefully plan check won't be too grueling thank you anyone else all right thank you very much I appreciate thank it you. thank your whole team I know it's uh, quite a few of you over there working on that all right I'll entertain a motion on the consent calendar as presented unless anyone would like an item pulled so moved second I have a motion by councilmember Krause I have a second by councilmember Barnes any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Moving on, we have two public hearing items today. Item number 10, consideration of amending Calistoga Municipal Code 17.48.040C3 to increase the number of marijuana plant, cannabis plants, I should say, that may be cultivated outdoors for personal use on certain residentially zoned properties. Zoning Code Amendment ZOA 2018 2. The recommended action this evening is to introduce the ordinance and waive its first reading. Taking us through this item this evening will be Director Goldberg. Lynn, thank you. And I'm sure you'll share some history on this with us. Uh, yeah. Just uh, briefly, as you know, the um, state law allows up to six cannabis uh, plants to be cultivated per dwelling unit, and uh, the city of Calistoga has chosen to allow uh, for single-family residences in certain zoning districts that two of those plants may be cultivated outdoors. Uh, when we were having uh, community forums on this topic, there was a commitment by the city that after we tried out the two outdoor plant limitation after the 2017 fall har 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 harvest had passed, we would revisit the topic and we reported back to the council in May. Um, you received an update from the Calistoga Police Department that they had not logged any complaints related to personal cannabis cultivation, either indoors or outdoors, uh, since you adopted the regulations about a year ago, going on a year and a half. Um, following discussion in May, the council directed staff to initiate potential revisions to the cultivation regulations to potentially increase the number of plants that may be grown outdoors for personal use. We referred this to the Planning Commission and they held a public hearing in September. Uh, I just want to note that no public comments were offered at that hearing. Um, 
the commissioners did land on recommending uh, that if you were to increase the number of outdoor plants that they would recommend four um, with the based on the philosophy of just gradually increasing it to again see what the experience of the community is and if there were any uh, negative ramifications they did offer comments that uh, one commissioner had been approached by several residents encouraging her to support more plants uh, but several other commissioners noted that there didn't seem to be strong community support for doing so and as I mentioned nobody offered public comments during the public hearing portion <coughs> um, so there are various uh, actions available to the council one would be maintaining the status quo of two plants outdoors and if you um, just maintain the status quo this would provide a longer time period to evaluate the impacts of outdoor cultivation as more residents begin planting and are possibly more successful as, as they get more experience uh, another option would be increasing the number of outdoor plants to four which is uh, what the Planning Commission recommended again basically what they were saying is if you choose to increase it they recommended four but they weren't landing strongly on please increase it to four and uh, then of course another option is going um, all the way to the six that are allowed by state law and allowing uh, six plants to be planted per household um, this could of course lead to undesirable offsite and or security impacts um, but that is also an option to the council and um, the ordinance that's before you again would uh, increase the number of plants <coughs> to four great thank you very much council members any questions I, I, yeah, I, I remember when this uh, came before the council over a year ago uh, and we accepted the Planning Commission's recommendation of two plants uh, we had quite a contingency that would wanted us to go to a greater number of, of plants I suggested at the time that we see how it goes with two plants and uh, I have not heard a complaint about having two plants at this point the last time I heard from uh, the police department there had been no complaints to the police department and Mitch has left um, so I guess I'll I'll forward some hearsay there had been no uh, complaints that uh, had reached the police department with regard to theft or odor complaints or like that so I think consistent with uh, the action that the City Council took over a year ago that this is appropriate coming back to the council all right anyone in the public wishing to address this matter all right not seeing any movement toward the lectern I will close the public comment bring it back for the council for any further discussion um, we had said that we would go a year and it's been a year and a half on two there have been no registered complaints uh, I believe the city of Napa is up to six outdoor um, and we committed to the community that if there were no <laughs> issues or concerns then we would go ahead and entertain a larger number so I'm comfortable with the planning uh, planning Commission's recommendation um, and they did have a public hearing uh, mr. mayor yes uh, I too have had people citizens come to me and say why don't you just kick it up to six it's, it, it's out there people are doing it uh, two is fine why go through all the bother and hassle I tend to agree with them I would certainly suggest we go to six get this issue done with but if the council decides on four I can certainly support that all right any other council members uh, I think one of the reasons that we had no complaints we had no problems is because we've been so ca uh, cautious about it uh, we are now uh, going up to six because um, I won't recommend that because then um, we have to think about the neighbors, uh, uh, our neighbors, the ones they don't like the others and they don't like the activity, the extra activity surrounding, you know, um, uh, the properties where they, they uh, had more plans. So I will suggest um, 
that we stay with for and see how how it goes and then uh, my question will be if we started receiving complaints and stuff uh, we might have to go back to two all right anyone else vice mayor Dunsby. Uh I, I would just rather leave it like it is I'm clearly I'm out voted or outnumbered on this one but uh, if it's not broke don't broken don't fix it um, I'm happy to hear there haven't been complaints but I know that two plants yields a tremendous amount of marijuana and it's uh, not even possible for one person or two people to smoke all that <laughs> so um, I, I just would leave it the same but all right. that, that's the other reason that I will rather stay with uh, either two or four um, because, you know, with uh, more plants is more production and people might start doing illegal commercial, you know, and there's much selling, selling. So if, if you can't smoke what you're, all of what you're producing, what else are you going to do with it? And I have the exact same concern. Six plants is a farm. <laughs> it is you can gift it you sharing well, it with your neighbors well <laughs> all right I, and and i do have concerns about the neighbors i have concerns about kids having access and jumping fences and stuff like that so uh i've expressed my concerns from the beginning but okay and these these were concerns we had when we first initiated this and we said we'd allow the year to happen, and we had no registered complaints um, to, from that standpoint. All right, unless there's further discussion, I'll entertain a motion as presented and taking the planning, the motions for the planning commission's recommendation of going from two to four. So moved. They have to um, second. Wait, it's, an, it's ordinance. an ordinance. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Um, it's an ordinance, and we're going to waive the first reading. So if you're making the motion, guess what you get to do? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. I make the motion to amend Calistoga City Council Code 17.48.040, open parents C, close parents C, open parents 3, close parents 3, to increase the number of marijuana plants cultivated outdoors for personal use on certain residentially zoned properties, open parents ZOA2018-2, closed parents to four plants. Thank you. Uh, whoever would like to second that, you do not have to reread it. <laughs> second. Uh, we have a motion and a reading by Council Member Barnes. We have a second by Council Member Kraus. All those in favor? Oh, sir, roll call. Roll call, please. It's been a while, Kathy, since we've done an <laughs> ordinance. Thanks for being on the ball. Can we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Barnes? We did waive it. Aye. Councilmember Kraus? Aye. Councilmember Lopez Ortega? Aye. Vice Mayor Dunsford? No. Mayor Canning? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Moving on to item number 11, also a public hearing. Consideration of amendments to Calistoga Municipal Code Title 17 zoning to add definitions, provide consistent wording and formatting, and clarify the applicability of lot area and dimension requirements. Recommended action is to introduce the ordinance and waive its first reading. Taking us through this item will also be Director Goldberg. Thank you, Mayor and Council. During the Planning Commission's consideration of the design review application for the apartment project at 1514 Washington Street, members of the public asserted that the project could not be approved because the lot did not meet the minimum lot area and lot dimension requirements for the R3 zoning district. And as cited in the written staff report, there are standards that say uh, the following standards shall apply to development. There's a minimum lot area and there is also a minimum lot width that that particular project site did not meet. Although there is no language in the municipal code that expressly states minimum lot area and dimensions apply only to subdivisions of land or lot adjustments, this is how it has been interpreted by staff and validated by the Planning Commission and the City Council. We do not apply these lot area and dimension requirements when uh, property owners and applicants are seeking planning entitlements or building 
permits for existing lots that were lawfully created. Uh, to interpret the code otherwise would preclude owners of a substantial number of lots in the city from any further development on their properties. By way of example, I uh, include in the staff report a little table of uh, properties on the east side of 4th Street which were contiguous to the apartment project site which uh, shows that uh, none of the lots meet the minimum lot width requirement of 90 feet and most of them don't meet the minimum lot area as well. And if we were to strictly interpret the code requirements, that would mean that no further development could occur on any of those lots, even in the form of an accessory structure, a swimming pool, uh, any improvements to the site. And that is clearly not the intention of the code. And we agreed that um, it could uh, use clarification. And so uh, we brought this to the council uh, months ago, and you directed us to initiate uh, code amendments to clear up any confusion and um, make sure we were in applying it and interpreting the non-conforming uh, provisions correctly. So uh, what is before you is uh, adding a specific section to Chapter 17.44 describing um, or explaining that non-conforming lots can be developed if uh, even if they're less than the minimum lot area or uh, they don't meet all of the minimum lot dimensions um, as long as that development is in accordance with all the other provisions of the zoning code of course so as long as the lot was legally created um, it can still be further developed if it uh, meets the other provisions of the zoning code and we are also recommending that in order to clarify that these minimum lot area width and depth requirements are not true development standards, but they are, do apply to subdivisions and lot line adjustments. We're uh, recommending a restructuring of eight of the zoning districts to separate those into their free, uh, freestanding section in each of the zoning districts, uh, separate from development standards. And then um, other things that we're recommending in terms of clearing up uh, you know, I can't resist once we get into <laughs> the zoning code chapters. As long as we're in there, we may as well fix them a little bit. Um, just to emphasize that no development standards would be altered, but we are proposing some reformatting and rewording so that every zoning district is structured in the same way. And that uh, helps us to find uh, provisions in there quickly. And it also helps uh, others outside of the department to um, look for information. Um, we're also recommending the addition of uh, two uh, standard definitions that for some reason are um, currently not included in the zoning code that we, we use these terms every day interior side yard and street side yard and then again most importantly adding a section um, called non-conforming lots to the non-conforming chapter and retitling that chapter. The Planning Commission considered these amendments uh, at a public hearing on September 26th and uh, several members of the public expressed concern that the language we were proposing at the time would exempt development of nonconforming laws from having to comply with the code's development standards and we agreed and so we uh, staff worked with the city attorney to further clarify the wording and um, have uh, we've revised that section to reflect the city attorney's guidance and so we are um, recommending that the um, City Council adopt the draft ordinance and I've also included um, an attachment that shows exactly how the restructuring is proposed and that the development standards are remaining unchanged in each of the affected zoning districts. Happy to answer any questions. It's a little little deep, but <laughs> it's important. Thank you very much. Council members, any questions of staff on this? Yes, I wanted to ask Glenn uh, one question specifically as it relates to the fourplex that started all of this. Are any of the changes that are in this proposal make the outcome of what occurred over there any different? In other words, would the code change to the point where that building couldn't be built or would it be allowed to be built as it was proposed? Uh, there are no changes uh, proposed to the development standards, so that project would, it's simply to clarify that despite the fact that it's a non-conforming lot in terms of lot area and, and one of the lot dimensions, that it's still a buildable lot and is developable. So um, it could still move forward. 
because there are no changes to the development standards and it was not re requesting any variances from the the development standards per se okay so there's nothing in this that would preclude concerned citizens of some future project on a non-conforming lot from approaching the city council asking for modifications uh, asking for modifications to the project to, to design the, to the project um, no they always have the ability to appeal a planning commission decision but it's it was it's simply clarifying that even though it's a non-conforming lot it is developed okay anyone else all right this is a public hearing does anyone wish to address the council on this matter Please share with us, should you so choose, you are not required, your name and your address. And please limit your comments to a maximum of three minutes. Uh, real, Donnie Higgins, 1410 4th Street. So um, this came up, as pointed out, because of the um, uh, multi high density, multifamily dwelling complex at 1514 Washington that they were now going to change to a 4th Street address. Sidelight. Okay. So I'm one of these people that owns one of these non-conforming lots. So after tonight, when the council says we like this coding, and I like it too, should I, the question I have, because I fall, if my house should burn tomorrow, I was a single family dwelling, I guess in the past it was an R1, it's now an R3. So what I have to, Lynn can answer this because I just want it on the record, would I be required by the city to construct an R3 zone building complex? Director Goldberg. Do you have what, sorry? Do you have any other points or questions to ask before? I fall short of the new developmental standards when okay. you make lots together, and so I want to know: Can I replace a single-family home with another single-family home without a variance or special permits or any other type of um, requirements by the city? Okay, Director Goldberg. Yes, there is a provision in the non-conforming mm -hmm. chapter that you can replace the single-family dwelling and as long as it conforms to all of the development standards, setbacks, lot coverage, parking, uh, as long as you do it in a timely manner. And there's a certain time period that's Is the timely manner written on the books anywhere? Uh, I believe you have to uh, pull a building permit within six months. Okay, so if it falls down or an earthquake hits it down or something. And so I have the same rights because I'm R, I am single family dwelling, but I'm now zoned R3. I have the same rights to add, add a bedroom or anything that any other single family dweller has? Yes, you do. Thank you very much. And the last question, I know I keep going up. If this new code was designed that people want to, my neighbor and I want to sh sell both our lots tomorrow, and a developer wants to come in and they're R3, does he have to comply with, this is designed for lot, new line setbacks. In other words, if these lots are still too short and they still don't meet, even combined, they don't meet the new standards. Is he prevented, a developer prevented from building on those sites? If the depth of the lot is just uh, on page, mm -hmm. you have a depth requirement, a new, you have a depth requirement that you're putting in for new building and lot line adjustments, correct? on page yes. so as long as they complied with the development standards or obtained a variance for a reduction in setbacks or parking or whatever they did not meet they could develop those lots they, they would ask, have to ask for a variance Correct. well if they could not meet all of the development standards the physical development standards in terms of setbacks lot coverage parking and I, developmental standards right that are we're going to approve yes. tonight about depth but those aren't changing Right, the depth of the the minimum lot depths in the R three is change, is not changing. Okay. So they they could they could develop just like uh, the 1514 Washington Street project was going to develop. They were not requesting any variances, and they were in compliance with all the development standards of the R three district. Okay, because if you look at the chart that you have showed on Fourth Street, the depth of our lots falls short. Yes. The so, 90 feet required. So if we were to combine those, they're still too short to build an R three dwelling. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're on the same page. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, Anyone? Oh, hold on. Oh, I'm sorry. Still, still public. Oh, sorry. Um, anyone else in the public wishing to address this matter? All right, I will close the public comment and bring it back to the council for clarification, discussions, or questions. Uh, Lynn, two questions on the timeliness. You said it was six months. You have to apply. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't have it in front of me. I mean, 
Is yeah. there is there any wiggle room in there? Can you get an extension? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. We my, we my would always work sick, with yeah, somebody whatever. who was who had lost their home. Okay, and then the second question is: Once the clock is running, can there be extensions on the actual yes. thing itself? Again, for reasons that yes, for any building permit, uh, extensions can be uh, requested of the building official and granted under reasonable circumstances. For, for normal, you know, right. Life happens. Reasons. Yes. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. All right. Other council members with questions. All right, Lynn. Thank you for your work on this. I will entertain a motion on. This item as presented, understanding that we are uh, waiving the first reading. I'll make a motion that we adopt ordinance number 740 and mm -hmm. waive the first reading. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Calistoga amending Calistoga Municipal Code Title 17 zoning to clarify the applicability of lot area and dimension requirements in various zoning districts and to reformat certain chapters to improve their usability. Parenthesis Z0A 2018-3 and parenthesis. Thank, I'll second that. Thank you. We have a motion by and a waiving the first reading by Councilmember Krause, a second by Council Member Barnes, any further discussion? Can we have a roll call, please? Council Member Krause? Aye. Council Member Barnes? Aye. Council Member Lopez Ortega? Aye. Vice Mayor Dunsford? Aye. Mayor Canning? Aye. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Goldberg, and thanks for clarifying all and cleaning that up. Um, item number 12, under general government, consideration of a resolution requested by Richard and Dina Dwyer, the Dwyers, to enter into a Mills Act Historic Property Preservation Agreement for preservation of the historic Francis House located at 1403 Myrtle Street, APN 011-242-015. The recommended action this evening to the Council is to adopt the resolution. Taking us through this item will be Zach Tuzinger, right? Tuzinger. Tuzinger. Mm -hmm. I just call him Zach, so. That works. <laughs> Uh, good evening, Mayor. Council. Zach, is this your first time in front of the council? This is my first time in front of the council. Welcome, uh, Zach. Thank you. It's <laughs> a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm, I'm here to talk to you tonight a little bit about the Francis House. We saw a picture of it up on the screen a little bit earlier during Lynn's presentation. Um, the City Council authorized the local implementation of a Mills Act program in 2010. Mills Act contracts are designed to incentivize the restoration and preservation of historic properties and offset the costs of that restoration and maintenance. And that's done by, in exchange, the property owner gets a reduction in their property taxes. Uh, Richard and Dina, Dwy Dina Dwyer have applied for a Mills Act contract for the Francis House at 1403 Myrtle. I think everybody's pretty familiar with the property. Um, it was built in 1886. It's a Victorian French Second Empire style home, and it's the only remaining stone example of that style in Napa County. Um, it served as the city's hospital from 1918 to 1965, after which it sat vacant for 50 years, fell into a pretty advanced state of disrepair um, until the Dwyers purchased it in 2015 with the intent of restoring it. Um, restoration work uh, on the project began in 2016 after planning commission review and approvals. Um, the Dwyers worked very closely with an architectural historian to bring the home back um, into an approximate approximation of its late 1800s appearance. Um, and the work was done in accordance with the Secretary of Interior standards uh, for historic properties. And recently, the Dwyers actually received an award from the California Preservation Foundation for their work on this property. Um, I, I don't think it's any secret that this was a costly undertaking for them of over $3 million and um, at least $12,000 um, in monthly, or excuse me, annual expenses are expected in terms of maintenance costs for the historic building alone. Um, Calistoga has only entered into one other Mills Act contract that was for the Palmer House. I think a lot of people know it as the Elms. Um, that was uh, back in 2010. The fiscal impact on the city for that Mills Act contract has been around $800 per year. Um, and for the Francis House, both Richard and I work pretty closely with the assessor's office. And uh, the calculation early estimates are that the property taxes, if the council did approve the Mills Act contract for this, the property taxes would be reduced for them by about $10,000 in total a year. Uh, about $2,000 of that would be the city's share. Um, in exchange, they would agree to maintain and preserve the historic property, 
um, any changes they want to make, significant modifications, they'd have to come before the city for that approval. Um, the minimum term of a Mills Act uh, is established under the state law that authorizes it, and that's for 10 years. Um, they are also required to automatically renew each year until one of the parties, either the city or the property owner, um, elects not to renew the contract. Um, over the baseline of 10 years, uh, a rough estimate of lost property taxes to the city would be on the order of around $20,000. Um, however, I would also note that the TOT generated by the property, as it's now a bed and breakfast, uh, would more than offset those losses every year. Um, Richard is here to answer any questions, as am I, and staff does recommend approval of the resolution authorizing the Mills Act contract for this property. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zach. Um, I'll start on this one. I can't think of a better example for the creation of the Mills Act than the Francis House. Um, so with that said, any other council members with any questions? We do have Mr. Dwyer here. Um, I have said this before. I'll say it again. I'll say it every time I see you, sir, to you and Dina. Thank you, thank you, thank you for what you've done for this community in bringing back that historic beauty um, to Calistoga. Um, as some people may realize that building was uh, a few short months away from being raised as in knocked down so uh, thank you very much any other council members with questions or clarifications anyone in the public with any questions or concerns about the city losing two thousand dollars a year in property tax all right with that said I'll entertain a motion as presented so moved second we have a motion by Vice Mayor Dunsford. We have a second by Councilmember Lopez Ortega. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Jet Zach, well done. Every one of your presentations is going to go that way. <laughs> <laughs> thank Richard, you, Mr. Dwyer. Thank you, Richard. Please tell Dina thank you as well. Item number 13. Is anyone here? Okay. There we go. Item number 13, consideration of a resolution to purchase a replacement fire engine and equipment and authorization for the city manager to execute a purchase agreement with High Tech Emergency Vehicle Services, Inc. in an amount not to exceed $500,000 and approve a budget transfer from fire one-time impact fees 49-4700-4799 to the Equipment Replacement Fund 15-3299 and a budget adjustment for the expenditure to account number. Does anyone really know where these account numbers are? <laughs> One five, but I must read them, dash 4970 dash 4820. The recommended action this evening is to adopt the resolution as presented. Before proceeding, are there any disclosures from the council? Yes. Um, council Member Kraus. I uh, was in a conversation with Chief Campbell probably about a month and a half ago. Um, and he indicated that the department was uh, looking for a suitable replacement engine and that they uh, the need was uh, very urgent and that they had been looking at demo model fire engines uh, but that they could not find one that was completely suitable uh, I uh, had in the past worked for the company that manufactured the fire engine that uh, is uh, before us tonight. The company's name is Toyn. Um, I ended the, I should say they ended the uh, business relationship about a year and a half or two years ago because they changed distributors uh, and went to high tech. So uh, I was familiar that this, uh, with the fire engine, and I recommended to Chief Campbell that they have a look at it and apparently they did and they liked it so I just want to make sure that everybody is aware that um, of what my involvement uh, was there I have no business relationship whatsoever with Toyn uh, at this time have not had one for at least a year and a half maybe two years and that uh, I've never had one with a uh, high-tech which is the distributor. Thank you very much. Anyone else? All right. Taking us through this item this evening would be Chief Campbell. Chief Campbell, welcome back. Thank you. I was going to give it to Lynn since they've had every almost every item on here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good evening. 
uh, since the fall of 2017, uh, fire department staff was tasked with uh, developing a vehicle replacement study for the seven pieces of equipment the fire department uses. In 2018, staff completed the study which reviewed current vehicles and operational needs and provided recommendations to the city manager for further consideration. The study established the best practices for the replacement standards despite consideration that the state and national replacement standards um, do not exist. So there's really no standard saying when you have to take a piece of equipment out of service. Within that study, it was re recommended that Calistoga Fire Department's reserve engine, engine number 219, be replaced as soon as possible. The established replacement cost of this engine is five hundred and fifty to seven hundred thousand dollars. Engine two nineteen is nineteen ninety five type one engine and has been in service for about twenty four years now. Staff began preparations for future replacement and uh, appropriating future funds in the upcoming fiscal year two thousand nineteen and twenty. However, uh, this summer our frontline engine, engine 19, which is our newest one, went down for repairs and was in the shop for about six weeks. We uh, had to move engine 219 to the front line. It was used almost daily when we could keep it running. It experienced numerous mechanical issues and uh, is just not a reliable engine. These vehicles are very necessary for protecting public health and safety within Calistoga and the surrounding area. And the staff has identified three demo uh, engines that are available immediately. The first one is a 2006 Pierce Arrow. The asking price for that is $530,376 plus tax, plus inspection trips, and delivery from Florida. This engine does not meet the specifications that we would need. It does not have a pump and roll capability. And the wheelbase in this vehicle is way too long for our area. Second engine is a 2018 Sabre made by Pierce, demo type uh, one engine, and they're asking $465,872 plus tax, plus inspection trips, and plus delivery from Wisconsin. And it does not meet the specifications of the ability to pump and roll. The third engine, and the engine that we're going to be recommending tonight, is a 2018 towing demo type one engine. And the asking price is 447706 plus tax, no inspection trip, and no delivery charge. This engine does meet our specifications of the ability to pump and roll. Staff is recommending the purchase of the 2018 towing demo type one in the following amount. The purchase price of 447706, sales tax of $34,697.22. And I'm asking for uh, additional $15,000 to buy some equipment that this engine doesn't have. Generally, the purchase of supplies and service equipment are governed by the Calistoga Municipal Code in values that exceed $30,000. This purchase does meet that requirement. And additionally, the City Municipal Code allows cooperative contracts with other governmental agencies to establish um, so that the city can take advantage of other governmental agency contracts or bidding processes. City Municipal Code Section 3.34.110 states as follows. Cooperative contracts with other governmental agencies may be established to allow the city to utilize other government contracts that have been or will be competitively bid. The city is a member of a National Joint Powers Alliance uh, companies called Sourcewell, which is a nationwide public agency purchase, purchasing agent that solicits bids for various vendors for equipment. This JPA combines the buying power of numerous public agencies from all over the country to, to provide competitive solicited cooperative contracts for the necessary equipment or products. Towing is approved vendor with this GPA and the fee is covered in the purchase price of the engine. The city's common practice of using this JPA is also present in the recent Public Works Department's purchase of a new dump truck. The engine at a very discounted price. The same will be the case in the new Type 1 engine purchase. 
thus the purchase of the replacement fire engine and equipment <coughs> would be through a competitive contracting process conducted by the JPA which identified towing as an approved manufacturer and high-tech emergency vehicle services Inc as an approved vendor the city as part of its research relating to the possible replacement of engine 219 sought quotes for other from other vendors a negotiated quote from high-tech emergency vehicle services is 447,706 which is significantly less expensive than the competitive vendors offering comparable type 1 fire engines in addition the purchase price is significantly below the anticipated 550 to 700 thousand dollars for the replace replacement cost of the anticipated vehicle the towing fire engine also offers a unique set of features and that's that pump and roll feature that is an auxiliary motor on the engine that allows the vehicle to be moving and spraying water at the same time without using the main pump the other two engines didn't were not capable of that the uh, purchase of the fire engine and equipment would include a two-year guaranteed parts and service from high-tech and various warranties from the manufacturer of various parts of the engine for periods ranging from two years to 20 years the recommended resolution authorizes the city manager to execute the purchase agreement with high-tech emergency vehicle services in the amount not to exceed 500,000 which includes acceptable sales tax and authorizes staff to procure the additional equipment this engine was not budgeted for in the 2018 budget 2018-19 budget excuse me and did not contain funds to purchase this uh, this engine and it was not planned for until next fiscal year Therefore, a budget adjustment for the purchase of this vehicle of $440,706, acceptable tax of $34,697.22 in miscellaneous equipment, fittings, etc., $15,000 is needed. Staff recommends a budget transfer in the amount of $500,000 from the fire impact fee fund, 49-4700-4799, to the equipment replacement fund 15 3299 and a budget adjustment for expenditures to account number 15 4970 4820. Once the 2018 model arrives and we swap over all the equipment off the old engine and get it in service, we will immediately try to sell the old engine. This uh, item does not uh, require CEQA review and it's consistent with the council's goals and objectives council goal five uh, offer excellent professional services to all customers objective one continue to provide a high standard in delivery of emergency services and there is a draft resolution attached which will authorize the purchase of the engine the budget adjustments and to surplus engine 219 I would be happy to entertain any questions you have at this time. Thank you, Chief Campbell. Council members, any questions of the chief? Uh, maybe this is a question for Dylan. Uh, if I read this right, there is that amount of money in the fire impact fee fund, which we had earmarked to be transferred next budgeting year for this vehicle, amount of somewhere between five and seven hundred thousand. But we're going to transfer it a year early, and it will be five hundred thousand or a little bit less not like we're just taking it out of the general fund it's in a fund right now we're going to use it a year early yeah yes exactly correct okay thank you anyone else any questions anyone in the public have any questions <coughs> city manager Feek, if we were to approve this tonight would a purchase order be executed immediately yes we've actually been trying to delay the uh, the demo vehicle from being sold to someone else we were very impressed with the price we actually had them bring the vehicle to calistoga so our firefighters could drive it around uh, the chief was unable to drive it but the feedback from the uh, fire from our from calistoga's uh, finest was that it was a, a wonderful vehicle it made its way with a full tank of water right up uh, petrified forest road which is our test um, but it did a fantastic job they're very thrilled it's a nice piece of equipment um, we've the city attorney and I have drafted all the agreements we've worked with the parties we've tried to get them to bring it out here for the last month or so 
since the, we, we demoed it on site uh, so that no one else uh, grabbed it from underneath us, but we're ready to go pending council approval. And we didn't scratch it while it was on loan to us, did we? <laughs> <laughs> no, and I would like to add that uh, we did negotiate that price down from what they were first asking for it. So there's quite a savings there. Would, Thank you. Would there be any additional training costs for your staff? No, we're pretty familiar with that, that type of interest. Great. Thank you. All right. Not seeing uh, any other comments, I'll entertain a motion as presented to adopt the resolution. So moved. Second. We have a motion by Councilmember Krause. We have a second by Vice Mayor Dunsford. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Chief, go buy a fire truck. <laughs> and drive it. By the way, for $447,000, does it come with Bluetooth and air conditioning and all that, or no? Great, great air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> Can we use that to deliver cupcakes and no, stuff for the no. raffles? <laughs> <laughs> all right, moving on. Item number 14, which some of you are probably in the room for. Uh, consideration of a resolution authorizing the city manager to purchase a portion of the Napa County Fairgrounds in the amount of $225,000 per acre and authorizing the city manager to prepare, prepare a final purchase and sales agreement. The recommended action this evening is to adopt the resolution. Uh, are there any disclosures? Uh, I will disclose that I was a member of the negotiating subcommittee um, for this discussion with the county, which started as a JPA, and then uh, we rolled into a purchase, purchase discussion, and I served alongside of Councilmember Barnes and City Manager Feek. So I just made your disclosure for yep, you. Yep, I'm disclosed. With that said, City Manager Feek, can you please take us through this item? Yes, thank you, Ms. Mayor. Um, I'm going to try and be as brief as I can when uh, trying to, you know, provide information about a process that started on October 4th, 2016. Uh, the city has been working now for uh, 25 months plus with the county on the future of the fairgrounds. Um, it's been a long process. Um, there's been a lot that's happened in that last 25 months, as you know. So I'm not really going to spend a lot of time talking about how we get here because we've had uh, council reports uh, that provide you that information back in late May. Uh, but now the item before you is really uh, one of the items that came out of the closed session we had uh, last week. Um, the city uh, has provided guidance to myself, to the ad hoc committee to negotiate uh, terms of purchase and sale of, a, of the fairgrounds. Um, this has been consistent with direction given by the city council before and also the city's vision uh, for uh, that property which is to maintain and enhance that property I'll be very clear and candid with anyone that's listening people come up to me and ask well what's going to happen to this or when are you going to build a casino when is such and such resort coming in there um, there's been a significant amount of sharing and thoughts to which I am quite surprised and shocked to learn um, because I who have probably been the most involved with these negotiations um, am not aware of any of that so um, I will be very clear and candid about the last two years of time has been spent discussing at first uh, a joint powers authority and when the dynamics shifted and the environment shifted the purchase and sale of the property where the city would own the property that does not involve enhancing the property that does not involve knocking down buildings that does not involve the much needed retrofitting and renovations needed out there to make the property viable and fit the city's vision of what we want to do. It's been about how do we acquire the land. So the city of Calistoga and our residents own the land. Uh, an opportunity that we've never had in the last 80 plus years. <clears throat> Following closed session, the mayor and the council directed me to uh, release the terms uh, uh, that the city and the county have both agreed to. Um, I'll just make reference for everyone that in your in the council packet attachment four, you can see the terms there I believe there are 20 uh, that the city and the county have tentatively agreed to the first uh, point I would make out is this agreement is non-binding until it is final so at any point in time either the city or the county can walk away from this purchase uh, from the, the terms of this agreement uh, I'm going to go now over some of the key terms which I think are important, but I just make note, anyone uh, who's interested, please take a look at all terms. If you have comments, thoughts, feedback, let us know. <clears throat> the city and the county have worked at trying to find some common ground, and for a long time the city and the county was far apart in terms of what we were willing to pay and what the county was willing to offer. Both sides do appraisals, both sides have uh, interests that they're looking out for. Um, the city 
uh, was able to comfortably feel that we could make an offer to purchase a portion of the fairgrounds at a price that we felt was appropriate and fair to the city of Calistoga. The county has agreed to these terms. Um, as, as presented, the city would purchase approximately 34.3 acres of the 70.6 acre property in an amount uh, equal to $225,000 per acre. The total for the 34.3 acres would be $7,717,500. 7, $717, the portion of property that the city would purchase, also shown in attachment one, is essentially everything excluding the golf course. The city would own the RV park, the city would own the racetrack, the speedway, the city would own the Butler Building, the Tubbs Billion, the Arts Center, um, the Great Lawn. It would own the grandstands and the, the, the I don't know if you call it the, uh, the, the barn, the construction, the, the pavilion, excuse me, um, but also the small space where we're proposing, uh, working on relocation of the Napa uh, County Office of Education right next to Boys and Girls Club. Um, so almost half. The county would retain the remaining portion of the property, uh, which would be the golf course and the recycled water. A key element uh, for making this transaction work, there are utilities, there is access, there are roads, there are things that cross both properties. Uh, and so the city and the county will need to, to work together on how those utilities are moving from one parcel to another when you now have new owners. <clears throat> the the if the council decides to move forward tonight, you're essentially authorizing the city manager to work with the county and draft a purchase and sale agreement. The county will draft the initial purchase and sale agreement within the next 14 days, after which the city and the city attorney's office will be able to review, comment, and opine on that purchase and sale agreement uh, with the goal of reaching terms in 30 days. Of course, we can extend that 30 days if needed, uh, but it it will take time to finalize that document to purchase uh, the property. That document will need to be approved by both the County Board of Supervisors and the Calistoga City Council. Once that is done, within 30 days following, uh, uh, within 30 days, then that purchase and sale agreement will set out several terms and items at this, uh, uh, regarding the actual deal, if you will. <clears throat> the city from that point the point of approval of a purchase and sale agreement has 120 days to go through its due diligence period. This is the period where the city spends time uh, putting together our financial plan, putting together our budgets and our pro forma, transitioning your account codes from who knows what they are now, I know what they are now, but from what they are now to city account codes, government account codes that match our city ledgers. We'll have HR policies, personnel rules, uh, contracts that we'll need to review. The city is assuming the risk and the liability, so we'll have insurance that we'll need to prepare. Um, also, we have uh, many buildings, many you know lawn space, trees. We're going to want to do arborist reports. We're going to want to look at conditions of maybe not necessarily buildings. We know what they are, but we want to look at electrical panels. We want to look at roofs and see if there are leaky roofs. We want to look at several items uh, as part of our due diligence before we seal the deal and take over ownership of 34.3 acres. <clears throat> during during the, the due diligence period, the county uh, will provide all the documents and materials to the city, including environmental reports, surveys, studies, permits, plans, all the documents that they have on file related to the property. Um, in addition, the county would also confirm the actual physical boundaries of the two new parcels, one parcel being the golf course county-owned parcel, the other parcel being the city-owned 34.3 acres. Um, a couple points now that I'd like to, uh, actually really it's the last point that I'd like to make tonight before uh, uh, offering up to this council for questions. Um, one of the items that has been a constant discussion point between the city and the county has been um, from a philosophical perspective, the county as a landowner can sell that land for a highest and best use. And, and as a landowner, you can ask whatever price you want. This, this property has never been uh, uh, marketed on an open market. The, they have been negotiating directly with the city. Um, so despite uh, what our appraisal says or uh, what our thoughts are regarding the price of the property, the county has the ability 
to accept whatever offer they want and they the county has believed the city is getting a deal that is less than the market value they would get if they were to sell the property on the open market considering that and that they do want to see the property be owned by the city they've asked for a buyer's restriction which would be a 20-year restriction on the property um, the way and this this item if you look at your language excuse me I just want to make sure I'm pulling the bullet point it's item number 11 I'm going to read specifically just so we know exactly what this restriction looks like the purchase and sale agreement will contain a 20 shall contain a 20-year restriction or covenant which would require the buyer being the city to share in the proceeds of any sale or lease of property where remuneration is received in excess of the current market value of the sale or lease and in excess of what the buyer paid per acre on any portion of buyers purchase property this essentially does is for the county if the city were to buy this at a price per acre below market value and we turn around and flip it uh, and we sell it for five hundred thousand dollars per acre or we lease it to someone say hey we're gonna lease it to you because we're not gonna sell it we'll give it to you for a buck a year you pay us back five hundred thousand dollars a year there was concern from the county that we've ne they've never marketed this on the open market and for the city we want a 20-year restriction we've gone back and forth on what this restriction looks like uh, for purposes of the section any sale or lease buyer buyer shall share in the cumulative value of these transactions based on market value at the time um, and the buyer shall allocate to seller the greater of either 50% of the proceeds from such sale or 50% of the market value of such transaction being a lease <clears throat> the amount will be diminished by two and one half percent each year over a period of 20 years whereby the restriction would be null and void so it starts at 50% of, of proceeds which exceed the market value and exceed the price that we pay for the land if we lease it to such a party or if we sell it to such a party um, and, and and it would be on a scale that's a diminishing scale starting at 50% going down over the next 20 years two and a half percent a year you know our contention as a city has been we have we have never had any interest in selling the property uh, that's a public benefit it should be for the public use uh, and we're not interested in selling it still the county felt uh, adamant that this language was included um, under consideration of City Council um, I don't believe there are I mean all the items of the uh, of the per of the, uh, the the offer sheet are important but I don't believe it, uh, I need to spend more time talking about them right now um, at the very beginning I mentioned there there is a non-binding agreement section in the in this the city can walk away at any point in time as can the county um, at this time with this project the city is only authorizing the city manager to begin negotiating on the purchase and sale agreement we've not encumbered any funds we've, we're not spending time thinking about what what repairs need to be made to buildings or how we're going to manage the property um, one of the key items which I'd like to just share is it's been clear that as a city we're not going to take over any kind of ownership interests or responsibilities of the property until such a time as we close the deal so you know we're, we're definitely moving forward as we always have to acquire the property but we have our due diligence to work uh, to work out and we want to make sure we spend our time on our on our finance plan on our budget and and you know understand you know everything about that property before we take on this this responsibility um, the uh, this item is really setting the, the the stage to meet some of your key council goals and objectives that you outline each year um, first and foremost maintain and enhance economic vitality of the community and the financial stability of the city uh, priority project number four was support long-term land stewardship of the Napa County Fairgrounds you know I, I certainly would suggest we consider a, a, a name change if the city is to purchase it um, maybe the uh, the Dylan Feek no I'm just teasing I'm just teasing <laughs> <clears throat> uh, 
um, but then also uh, Council Goal 4, expand and improve recreational community facilities. As, as we've discussed, there's a tremendous opportunity there at the fairgrounds. And you, know, you don't have to look far, the site where the Boys and Girls Club is located, Logue V Park, where the city has got has become engaged on that section of town and really turned um, properties into beautiful community assets. Um, I just, I just, I just want to share my appreciation for Jim and for Chris uh, and all the hard work and thought that they've given. Um, you may be a few other comments kind of related yet not necessarily so about the work that the ad hoc committee has done. We have looked at every financial report and audit of the Fair Association. We've turned over every rock. We've asked questions. We've tried to understand the financing. We've looked at how the property would generate revenue from day one, whether it's the RV park, the event spaces. We've also considered the needs that we have, like providing water to the golf course and what could the county do uh, if we were working together. They take on half of the site. We take on the other half. Um, I think it's a, it's a wonderful partnership. I do think it will take more partners to make it happen. Um, I'm very interested and eager to keep moving forward, but I won't be bashful. The gray hairs on this side of my head are all from this deal. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, council might have. Thank you. Thank you, City Manager Feek. Uh, and while Councilmember Barnes, myself, and the City Manager were involved in the actual negotiations because they were, it was a two by two situation, uh, meaning not registering the Brown Act and you could get into real property negotiations. Um, we had regular check-ins with the council. The council made it very clear during closed sessions, um, made it very clear what their intent and interest was and what our boundaries were. Um, this council has worked very hard to put us on very stable and sustainable financial ground. And the last thing we were going to do uh, is become house poor on this fairground where we bought it with everything we had and had no more money left to fix it. Um, so that was uh, one of our, our key uh, responsibilities and drivers. Also, this council uh, wanted to make this acquisition without unduly burdening our residents. Um, so we are not looking at um, a property tax increase. We are not looking at a parcel tax. Uh, we are able to do this on future funds generated via TOT, um, compliments again of this community's uh, adoption on the two referendums of the two resort projects. Uh, there will be significant revenue coming into the community that has put us in a financial position to allow us uh, to uh, even enter into a discussion and transaction. A couple of clarifying points. Um, it was the city's, once this went from a JPA discussion with the county, uh, to a land acquisition. Um, again, the city, the council's intent was land acquisition. Um, we, our intent was to acquire as much of the parcel up to all of it um, as possible. Uh, we sit here today still interested in acquiring the entire 70 acres. However, uh, there is a difference of opinion and perspective on what the other half of the parcel is worth. So at this point, we will acquire uh, what we can and what is offered to us at a price that we deem uh, and feel is fair and reasonable. Um, a couple of questions we cannot answer for you tonight. So you can come up to the podium and ask them. Um, but what is the county going to do with their parcel? You'll have to ask the county. At this point, uh, what they've expressed to us is continue its use as is, which is a golf course, but obviously they need to do their due diligence, due diligence as well. Um, you can come up and ask us what we're going to do with the parcel that we acquire. The answer to that is we don't have an answer for you today. The first priority, first and foremost, which we consider to be the utmost importance, is the ability to acquire as much acreage as possible for the first time, as Dylan referenced, in almost 80 years. Um, to have a parcel of land in the heart of our community for the last 80 years that was out of our jurisdiction, out I should say out of our control, um, is a tough one for us. And we are now in a position where we will be able to, uh, thanks to the partnership with the county, uh, we will be able to acquire that, uh, should all go well. And then we decide uh, publicly what we will do with the uh, activities that occur on that parcel. Um, it is being acquired for public purpose open space. 
Um, so despite what you have read on Nextdoor.com and maybe some of you have written on Nextdoor.com, there is no master plan for us to put in high-rise uh, affordable housing or build a Walmart or build a Starbucks. I mean, we reserve the right to do all of that, but at this point, uh, there are no plans uh, other than to first and foremost acquire the asset, and that's the land. Um, <coughs> With that said, Councilmember Barnes, if anything you'd like to add, or did we kind of sum that up? Uh, I think you got it pretty good, and I want to thank Dylan for his tremendous amount of work in two years. Uh, a couple of technical points. We will be putting down a $100,000 deposit, which is fully refundable during our due diligence if we find that we want to back out of the deal. And secondly, the house on the golf course stays with the golf course. We will not be owning that house will own the house next to the RV park. Council members, questions of staff before we open to questions. All right, is there anyone in the public who has any questions regarding this parcel? Please approach the podium. Should you so choose, share with us your name and your address, but you're not required to do so, and limit your comments to a maximum of three minutes. <sighs> Dennis McNay, Foothill Boulevard. Oh. Mayor Canning, congratulations on your tough-fought re-election battle. Couldn't have done it without you, Dan. Oh, wait, you're not even... You're, oh, can you vote in the city? Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dennis. He didn't vote for you, though. Uh, that's and, okay. and Gary, too. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I was wondering if you guys, the city, won the lottery. $8 million for this property, half a million dollars for a fire truck to protect it. This is great. I like it. All this money. But I... I I, I can't, you know, Chris, I always thought you were really Monty Hall in disguise. I know you could make a better deal than this. <clears throat> As I think, you know, the uh, Napa County, they should give us that property. Because it's going to take about $8 million to retrofit that mess and bring it up where it's safe to use again. Have you thought about that? We have. Okay. And you're, you're going to make that an income property where nobody has ever been able to do that? Uh, they've ma been making in income on that property. On the golf course, right? On the, par uh, on the parcel we're buying, there's <laughs> been income made. Okay, the racetrack. But yeah, I, you know, what you're taking on is a major liability. You know, you know just the insurance. It's kind of like the swimming pool. Yeah, it was a great idea, but the, you know, the maintenance and the liability is cost in the city. They're not making any money off that. And I'm afraid this might end up the same way. It's just going to be costing the city more money than the benefit you're going to get out of it. And like I say, for what the needed repairs, I, if I was Napa County, I'd be happy to get rid of it. So really, I need, think you need to think about what needs to go into that to make it viable. That's all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you. We've had uh, 24 months of analyzing to get through this. In fairness to uh, our partners at the county, of which we are part of, it is their responsibility as a government agency representing all of us, we are Napa County residents, to extract maximum value for their asset. It is our responsibility as a local government agency to expend as little of that uh, of our cash for acquiring assets. Uh, we feel very comfortable. Um, after a long process with consultants input as well that we are getting a fair price for what we are receiving uh, we are well aware uh, and eyes wide open that there are um, complications with many of the facilities that we are acquiring uh, but when you balance all of that into what the current and future needs of our community are uh, this council feels very strongly that this is the right action to take and while the pool, uh, yes, costs us money and yes is a liability, uh, there isn't anything we do for our public that doesn't cost us money and isn't a liability. Uh, and the benefit that the community overall gets as a result of the pool, uh, I will champion that cause every day of the week. So, but thank you for your comments. Anyone else? Get to the mic first. Could <laughs> you tell me how these are zoned? They're all zoned public purpose open space, including the golf course. Anyone else? 
So if I can lead to your next question, Donna, which would have been, well, if they keep the golf course, can't they do what they want on it? And the actual answer, or the, the answer is uh, no. The current zoning is public purpose open space and the body responsible for changing zoning is this body up here. I just want, yeah, I figured you were leading me there. Is there anyone else? Seriously? Wow. That was easy. Um, I do want to thank again uh, our uh, friends at the county. Um, again, we are all part of Napa County. They represent us. We represent them. Um, they did what they had to do. We do what we have to do. Um, and they are on notice that should they change their mind, we would be more than happy to acquire the rest of it at a fair, what we consider to be a fair price. Uh, with that said, I will bring it back to the council for any further questions, clarifications, commentary before we move on. Does this require a vote or what do we It doing? does. It's, we have to the adopt resolution. the resolution. Well, Mr. Mayor, I would request that you make the motion, you work the hard, the hard bit, and I would be honored to second your motion. I would like to make a motion to adopt the resolution as presented. Second that. And before we vote, I to just clarify Dylan's question because this has come up since it's been in the papers. Uh, the city has no interest or intent to take possession of or management of this property, any portion thereof, until we are the owner of the parcel. So please don't ask us what we're going to do about X, Y, and Z um, project or event coming up. All right. With that said, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. We will adjourn to the next regularly scheduled meeting, which will be December 4th, 2018. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Have a great evening. Meeting adjourned.